Uh, thank you very much, and I'd like to uh, begin by uh, thanking, it's a tough one, Liu Mo Hansen, to, uh, for inviting me here, because we met in 2007, very briefly, I don't think we remember each other by name, but we were part of a conference that was funded by the Templeton Foundation on uh, theology and, and uh, religion. Um, so when I got an invitation, I, I thought, do they know who they're asking to come to an evangelical Lutheran community? I was told recently by your president, President Robin, thank you for uh, assuring me that it's okay, that um, <laughs> I'm free to talk about what I want to talk about. So thank you all of you here. Now, I just want to go straight into it, partly because time is uh, so, so short. Um, am I allowed to leave some moments for questions? Okay, because questions are more important to me than what I say, because I can write a book and that's it. But I want your questions to help me think through some of these issues. So I'm going to start by asking, what about the Silk Road? What is it about the Silk Road that makes all the difference in the world for me when I was looking at religions? One of the things that happened to me growing up in Malaysia, a country of 17 distinct um, religions, and being a fourth generation Christian, was to ask the question, how do I know? How do I know it's true? There are so many competing religions, and as a ethnic Chinese, the propensity was towards uh, Taoism and Buddhism. But because my family came from a very Anglophile culture, where none of us actually read or write Chinese, it began to dawn on me, now we have a question about universality and the question about credibility. How do I know this is true, and what, what does it mean if I tell my father I'd rather be a Muslim or a um, a Buddhist. Uh, that's when the rubber hits the road. So I explored this, and uh, when I went on to the study of the sciences, my focus was on biology and chemistry, and then later on in astronomy. And subsequently, when I was in London, uh, as I looked at legal studies, obviously I chose an area that um, coincided with an area I love, which is astronomy. So I chose air and space law. If you don't know what that is, it's a field of law where we look at what happens when planes crash and come down. And, jurisdiction, murders on aeroplanes, satellites falling out of the sky, damages on countries and stuff like that. In any case, so there in London, I met a retired uh, pastor, Dr. John Stott, who invited me to consider giving my mind to the Lord. Uh, I, I had no idea what I was talking about, but what he meant was, he said, Christian missions is wonderful, but in the 20th century, so you know how old I am, right? In the 20th century, he argued that there were two really difficult questions that faced the confessional Christian. One was the persistence of other religions. Why do they still exist in the 20th century? It's the kind of question you don't ask in polite company in a Christian world because nobody, nobody has the answer to it to start with, and we like to have neat, compact answers. Another question he raised was the immense success of the natural sciences. He had such a deep respect for what goes on, and he gave me a book about the, um, the mind. But later on, when I read his book on the uh, as a commentary to the Romans, Bible Speaks Today series, in one of the pages, he mentioned the idea of other kinds of humans, homo neanderthalensis, the Neanderthals. I was very impressed that a pastor with no formal training in the sciences can talk so respectfully about the discoveries of these fossils why they exist, what does it mean for the Christian in the context of this. So that sort of fueled my imagination to think about it. Now, one of the things that I learned when I was in law school was the idea of ad fontes, to the sources. Everything you talk about, can you find a source of it? Can you document it? And in natural sciences, is it universally applicable? Because there's no such thing as Chinese science or Japanese science or Islamic science. Science has to be universal. So these things really bubbled in my mind as a Christian. And I asked myself, my whole life, I've been telling people and myself the most important thing in my life is my faith in God and uh, principally in the context expressed in Jesus Christ. If that's the case, how do, I, how do I square the circle in that sense? And about 27 years ago now, I made that um, decision. To, uh, to cease my legal studies and became a missionary right here in uh, New York City, uh, in America. And the focus was international students. And subsequently, in 2003, I founded a new uh, context of understanding this in the Academy for Christian, for Christian Thought. And it wasn't Academy of Christian Thought, 
which means there is already a Christian thought and just an academy of it. But it's for Christian thought, which means we want to constructively create and rethink what it means to be a Christian in the context of all that we know. I, eventually, when I did my PhD in Princeton, I had to choose uh, an area of science, and typically I chose two. I chose the area of paleoanthropology, which is human origins, and the area of cognitive neuroscience, uh, which is about the brain and how the brain thinks and why memory exists, consciousness, emotions, all these sort of stuff. So let me quickly tell you why I chose this area of science, and then we'll move into the Silk Road itself. And I chose this because I began to think about human existence, how old are things. So I looked at it and said, human writing about 5,500 years ago. Now, it's kind of scary to think about it. Before 5,500 years ago, in the whole planet, we have no human writing. Writing is such a transforming thing because you can pass on knowledge through time and space. For the first time, you can pass on pretty accurate knowledge of what happened in the past. Before that, oral traditions, well, we know what that could mean. And then you look at the nature of cognition, what makes a human a human. Now, um, I gotta say, there are many claimants about what makes humans bipedalism, walking on two legs. Others will say, well, uh, language, the kind of grammatical language we have makes a difference. I think what makes us human is because we eat cooked food. <laughs> we are the only animals that eat cooked food. And I can tell you, I'm so glad for it, I bet God is a master chef. And i tell you why. <laughs> You try to eat food that is not cooked. It's hard. Uh, it takes a toll on your body. So you ask yourself, what happened to the human body the moment we started eating cooked food? To start with, a lot less food poisoning. That's incredible. <laughs> Number two, cooking is pre-digesting outside the body. That's all it is. So which means your body takes a lesser toll. So we know what happens to the human body. The gut becomes smaller. Compare the gut with the other primates, it's smaller. Now you have the resource to fuel the brain. The brain is such an expensive commodity, taking about 20% of all the energy of the human being while you're alive. And even when you're sleeping, the brain is functioning, you're just unaware of it, doing kind of repairs and reconsolidating memories. But um, the fact that we can cook food and the discovery and taming of fire is quite amazing. If you think about as far back as Rudyard Kipling writing his book about Jungle Boy. You've seen the movie Jungle Boy in cartoon? You'll see that the orangutan said, learn me the technique the, of the man, the, he calls it what? The red flower. What's the red flower? Fire! He wants to know how you tame fire. He realized that if he can tame fire, he can be like that man child's people. It is still what makes us different. When we learn to tame fire, Civilization took on a tremendous change, and one of them is that we eat cooked food. Apart from tasting better, it launches into a whole different kind of paradigm as a living species. We're able to think. We no longer spend all the time hunting for food and eating, and in the thinking, we begin to conceptualize of things that we now take for granted, thinking about God. That sort of connection between the idea that we can think beyond ourselves the perception of the future, the anxiety of the future, and the sadness of the past. The whole idea of time constraints, time and space, plays into a game of the human brain. So all this stuff fascinated me. And eventually, as I looked at what to do with my life, I realized one thing. I want to know firsthand how the whole thing works. I want to know what in the world is Christianity. Um, and according to John Stott, why do other religions exist? And what's the context? So I look at a globe and I said, who has done these sort of incredible journeys to see? And of course, the name that pops up is Marco Polo. A lot of you know Marco Polo. What fascinates me about Marco Polo was that he was a guy from the West and went to the East. He wasn't the first person, but he was the first person whose thoughts and ideas and recollections generated into a kind of a book called Travels, just called Travels. And by the way, he never wrote it. He um, talked about it to his cellmate in jail, and Ristichello was a, was a uh, romance writer. So he weaved the stories into a romantic book. That makes the book very difficult to read. I think the last count, there are 37 versions of it. And if you wonder why there are so many versions, this is 13th century stuff before the Western printing press. Every copy is hand copied. I just said Western printing press, didn't I? Because, yeah, the West didn't invent printing. In the British Museum today, you will see a document called the Diamond Sutra, printed in China, 868 AD. 
hundreds of years before Gutenberg knew his name was Gutenberg. Anyway, the point of this is the whole idea behind the Silk Road was fascinating. And the one thing that uh, came out of it was people talked about the Silk Road as if it's all about silk. But let me tell you, it's not about silk. It's about ideas. Ideas was what fueled the, the development of the East and the West. In the Han Dynasty, let me show you the Han Dynasty for a second. Those of you who have seen this before, to do bear with me. Can you see it here? Um, let me just see. There we go. You've got the Han Dynasty on the East and the um, Roman Empire on the West. They're contemporaneous, contemporaneous, about the same size. In those days, anything about religion would be filtered through the lens of these two major empires, including Christianity. Now, what was surprising for me in mission studies, because one of my friends, before he died, some of you may know him if you're into mission studies. His name is Samuel Moffat. He taught for many years at Princeton Seminary. And we would meet up every week or so, partly because he liked to needle me. I'm ethnic Chinese, but I can't read Chinese. He was born in China, and he can speak Chinese and Korean. So we would talk about history. So one day, I asked him a simple question, and I said, you just published this huge book on Asian Christianity. And his book is very funny, if you haven't read it before. He begins, and I paraphrase, he begins that Jesus was Asian. Jerusalem is in Asia, and then eventually something like, and it wasn't called the Middle West. The whole thing's East. Christianity is an Eastern religion, don't you know? <laughs> he wanted to say, and of course as a minister and a missionary, he just wanted to say, if you're not from the West, please don't think you're adopting a Western religion. There's nothing Western about Jesus or Christianity. It became adopted into the West. I thought, wow. That was fascinating, absolutely un-PC, but you see, he's retired, he didn't care. So he talked <laughs> about this. He would talk about all this stuff, so that fascinated me. And, and the thing, uh, he died at the age of 99, just a couple of years ago. And one day I asked him, I said, Sam, you must have been to all these places to look at this. He said, no, archival work. And I said, Ron, you don't understand. I was born before there were things like jet engines. Huh. And um, this was more than 20 years ago when he said that. And that was when I said, you know, I'm born after the jet engine. I should do something about it. My goodness, my old career in the legal services was about jet engines and studying when planes crash and why they do and all the legal ramifications. So I embarked on what eventually came a 17-year project to retrace Marco Polo's steps. But because we don't know exactly which step he took, it wasn't written chronologically, I took pretty much every possible permutation of his trip <laughs> across. It took a long time, right? In so doing, and people ask me, you have now studied Hinduism and Buddhism and then Islam. Uh, I studied Islam at Yale with um, uh, Lamin Sane. Some of you know his name as well. So we ask, what's all this about? Why do you need to know? And of course, one answer is this. And they say this. If, you do not, if all you know is your religion, you do not know your religion. You need to know what is it you don't know so that you're quite sure that this is um, a choice that you make consciously and why. In the context of this, there were so many religions across the Silk Road. The Silk Road is the safest place to find religion in its pristine forms and how it evolved. Now, what do I mean by that? No religion today is stagnant. Every religion is dynamic. It changes, adapts, and it adjusts. It adjusts to the, the questions people ask at the time that they were asking. And then I realized, if I went to India to study Hinduism, which I did, by the way, I'm only studying a 21st century development of selected parts of survivalist Indian religions that came out here. I don't really know what happened in India because every generation of political powers will shape it and economic powers. These are the two that change it. Same thing about Buddhism in China. If I want to study Buddhism in China, I'm studying the surviving ones, but there are so many forms. And same thing about Christianity in Europe. But if I study these three religions in the Silk Road and study in time and space to see how we change along the way, they are not protected by politics in the Silk Road. There were too many political movements and chains that the, to survive to where we are today, they either adapted or they adopted. And sometimes they just died like Manichaeism. It just died because it didn't have a champion. So I was tracing the, uh, the movements over there. The other thing that uh, became an important feature of asking this, and let me show you another slide. There we go. Oh, oh yep. Yeah. So if you, can, if you can see this, 
if you can see this slide, um, you will see the network. So in the red part, that is typically called the Silk Road, China. But I went further down south to Pakistan. That was just a few months ago. I call it the Indian Silk Road. So you find it in the top, right? What is the Indian Silk Road? That Silk Road that went down a Karakoram Highway. In the 1960s, for the first time, China and India and Pakistan was connected by road safely. They built this enormous project called the Karakoram Highway. It took over 20 years. Uh, I think 1,300 workers died. You are cutting across the mountain range next to the Himalayas, across moving plates, earthquakes, and as far as 15,500 feet elevation. You can barely breathe. And I can attest to you, it was hard because I went down the Karakoram Highway, 1,300 kilometers uh, just in October. I was following the route of the Xuanzang, the Chinese 7th century pilgrim who went from China through Pakistan and Afghanistan down into India to collect 25,000 Buddhist scriptures and his interpretation shaped what we now call Chinese Buddhism. One man, right? Incredible story. But he wasn't the only one. There were other pilgrims, but he was the most dominant. I wanted to see what it's like, so I, I like to go into in situ and feel the cold, feel the horrors to, to understand what drives these people who are so, um, they are so moved spiritually to take huge risks to understand this and come back and teach the others over the years. Some of you recall there was a book some years ago, became a movie, and I think it's called Perfect Storm. And the writer, um, in order to understand the horrors of how cold it gets, went to New Hampshire and wrote it in the winter without heating to understand what goes to your mind when you suffer that badly. And of course, in the process, he lost his girlfriend who couldn't cope with it. That's in the story, right? So part of a lot of my work is to do that, not just stay in the, uh, um, uh, the confines of New York City, but to keep going out, go to the deserts, the jungles, the mountains, to understand what drives these people to bring in these sort of message about God uh, into the people. And to understand God in his full complexity, I wanted to understand the expression of God through the minds of other people outside the Christian circle, outside my own circle of Presbyterianism, to see at what stage it made sense. And you might ask the question, why are you a, an ordained Presbyterian minister going outside the confines of work? And I'll tell you why. There was a time there wasn't a Presbyterian on the planet. There was a time when there wasn't a person called a Christian on the planet. There was even a time when there wasn't anyone who worshipped Yahweh on the planet. These are all very short periods, perhaps 3,000 years ago. But there were humans living as far back as 300,000 years ago. Was God present at that time? I'd like to think God was. So I raised these sort of issues, like what were they thinking? In that context before all these racial issues we talked about, what were they understanding? Modern paleoanthropology argues that about 50 to 80,000 years ago, the first of the Africans came out. This is called the out-of-Africa theory. They came out on what we now call the land bridge of Israel in, um, in Morocco, and then went on to Europe, mixed up with the Neanderthals so that you have 2% of Neanderthal DNA in your body, and then move on to what we call Australia ultimately about 50,000 years ago. And finally, they went down to the land bridge or the Bering Straits and ended up in Chile or Argentina right at the bottom about 15,000 years ago, the last of the, the human migrations. With this context in mind, we now ask the question, how do we do missions and apologetics with this in mind that people ask? Now, earlier on, I was talking to uh, one of your friends here, and he asked the question, why do, you, um, why do you do paleoanthropology that far back in history? And I said, because they are humans just like you and me, and that's a good question to ask. In the context of things that far back in history, my argument is this, today, Missions starts with apologetics. It doesn't start with going out there. It starts with getting your story straight right here. If you can't get an agreement on what is it that Christianity is all about, it's kind of hard to go out and tell people to believe in what you believe in because they will ask different questions. The other thing is, most of the world today ask questions that um, people like us in the West don't answer, but we give them answers to questions they never asked. There's something to think about too. So you might ask, what are the questions that they ask? Well, I don't claim to be an expert, but anecdotally, let me tell you some of the questions someone asks. 
Some of them ask, why was Jesus born there and it took so long for the missionaries to come to my great-grandparents and in the meantime, they died without accepting Jesus Christ? It seems unfair, fundamentally. Well, historically, what we've done, we've gone through a lot of theological gymnastics to somehow make it work, but it doesn't work very well if you are part of them. Uh, in, in my case, I'm part of them. I'm from the East, right? Some questions are asked are economic questions. Why is it at the end of the day, the West is still far richer than the East, no matter what religion you believe in? How do we understand that in that context? So these are real life questions you're asking. I can assure you, a lot of them, when I talk to them about God, they're not that interested in standardized theological arguments. Not really. They're not interested in homo usios. They're not that interested in the Trinity concepts. They want to know how universal is your God in that context. Well, um, as I began to explore, I started with India and with uh, Hinduism, which was very hard because I grew up in a context where anything that's not Christian is demonic. Anything that was not within the context of my specific denomination was also suspect, so it was difficult to get over that hump. Now, what really helped me was my love for astronomy. Um, when I was younger, I wanted to be an astronaut. That was before I realized the food is pretty bad. And um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. The food is pretty bad. And as I said, you know, if the greatest gift to humanity is cooking, then surely, surely it's really important your food. So I decided, well, um, if I can do astronomy, if I can be an astronaut, let me be an astrophysicist, you know, I can do something to learn about it. But eventually, the practicalities of living in Malaysia was such, every Chinese parent wants you to be uh, someone who makes money. And uh, you can make more money as a lawyer <laughs> than as an astrophysicist, so that's what I was told. In any case, that was how I was moving in one direction, but my mind was still thinking about the other stuff. In the context of this, now we ask for today's uh, topic. How does apologetics and mission play this role in our way of expressing what we mean to be a Christian in the 21st century? There are various ways to look at it, but let me lead you on a journey that was my personal journey as I embarked on my own doctoral studies to ask what's happening. Some of you know that Princeton was the first place that actually had a chair in science and theology. There was some Subsequent places like Oxford and Chicago and Boston that had um, science and religion, but theology was very rare. And um, when, they had, when the, the chair opened and I uh, started in 2000, it was very hard to understand how do we do this? What does it mean to have an interdisciplinary doctorate in science and theology? Which science are we talking about? You've got to choose test cases, right? So I chose human origins because that's been debated to the nth degree, and no one actually looks at the data. So people say, well, Adam and Eve was a couplet, and he lived here, then everywhere. And some people say it's Basra near um, Iraq, and others will say, no, it's further up. But the question was, what does the data tell us? Well, in 2003, the, the shocking discovery of what we call the hobbits put a lot of things on the map. Because here, it's not a human that looks like you and me. It's a three-foot human, but the feet are the full size of a modern human of five feet eight. So they're big-footed humans, and that's why they call them hobbits. The locals call them orang pendek, which is Indonesian or Malay for the short, the not short people, euphemism for small people, which is quite different. And when it first came out, everyone thought this is not a true type specimen because it could be a stuntation, could be a problem, medical a disease, but now they have 12 specimens, so now they're quite convinced it's an actual species. We asked ourselves, is that an Adam as well? Do they represent part of humanity? Uh, where was it? So in a lot of my work on paleontropology, it wasn't just who is Adam, but we asked the question at what point in the development of the human skeleton, the body, and of course the brain itself. Now here's the problem. The brain is a soft bit of the body. You cannot look back to see what a brain looks like. We can measure sizes. So historically, 600 cc is the size beyond which you become homo and human. The hobbits change all of that. They are much smaller, about 335 cc, but to all intents and purposes, their tooling is so sophisticated, it's hard to deny them the idea of being human. So now the whole world of paleontropology is sort of confused about what is a human. Others talk about bipedalism, and others talk about reasoning functions, and others talk about the idea that they can 
they can think of the future, they can plan ahead, long-term uh, planning. I was interested in at what point does the human brain think in terms of morality, so moral cognition, and therefore leading to the idea of God. In Cambridge, sometime in the late 1990s, uh, there's a guy, Stephen Mythian, and he calls himself an archaeologist of the mind, not of the brain. Brain is a physical stuff, a mind is a function. And he made the argument that sometime about 50,000 years ago, the human brain's different functions of space and time and color, they began, like a super chapel, he calls it, they began to talk to each other through the migration of neurons, and for the first time, it's called cognitive fluidity. The human brain can think the way we think today. Let me give some examples of um, this idea. When you see Michael Jordan jump about and, and you know, do the hoops, we say, what sort of intelligence does he has? He has spatial intelligence. In a very short space of time, as he jumps in the air, he looks around, he can make sense of the space, the feet of his body, and he can adjust in such a way that when it comes out, it's magical for those of us who love basketball, right? Spatial intelligence. You've got mathematical intelligence, mostly in IQ tests. You've got social intelligence. You have all kinds of intelligences, but the argument was around 50,000 years ago, they came together and formed the super brain that we have today. What evidence is he referring to? He's referring to art. Artwork is very expensive in a Darwinian context because you can't eat art. You can't feed your children art, but it takes so much energy to do art that there must be some other function. So in 2012, I uh, went to the caves of Spain with a guy called Ian Tedesal. He was the uh, uh, former curator of human origins at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Crawled through the spaces into the caves, and you can imagine the stunning, shocking thing to see this incredible cave art. There's one cave about 50 feet high, there the paintings were. This is about 12 to 25,000 years ago, some 43,000 years ago. And you stand in a cave looking up, 50 feet is pretty high, by the way. Let me see. That's about 50 feet, I think. How did they get up there? In absolute darkness, sometimes about 300 meters inside a cave. No sun, can barely breathe. They had to bring in light. What did they use? They used juniper um, because it burns without soot, and they used deer fat and they pass it on. These lamps can last only one hour. So they're having a flow of lamps going back and forth while the artist painted. When you think of that, all of a sudden, all your quarrels and denominations in the Christian church pale by comparison. And you feel a bit stupid quarreling about certain doctrines. When you look at that and you wonder, what were they trying to say? You find these handprints, right? And they drink the, um, they, they sort of, um, uh, imbibe some certain kind of dyes, the natural dyes, they're normally in four different colors, and they blow to make an imprint. Surprising thing in Spain, we found imprints of children's hands. They brought children into the cave to make these imprints. There are certain theories going around. Most of the theories are it's religious. It's an attempt to get to the other side. They understood death occurs, they want to know what's going on, and the cave was a place where they can't go beyond the wall. So the argument was a possible trajectory that if I put my hand on one side, my dead ones can connect with me on the other side in a way that I cannot visually see. Very interesting, very early ideas of religion. How early? Well, look at Christianity, 2,000 years old. Judaism, you can argue between 3,000 and 2,500, depending on whether it's rabbinical Judaism or earlier forms of Judaism, Yahwehism. What about the oldest known extant religions that we have? Gobleke Tepe in central Turkey, 12,000 years old when they built the temples. 12,000 years old, earliest known ideas of religious consciousness. And then you have paintings going back to 45,000 years old. That's a really long time. Now, if you go further in a place in South Africa called Pinnacle Point, there are other kinds of paintings, not representational like a cow or a horse, but these are um, iconic paintings. They are icons to represent something else. They go back to about 100,000 years. Why would human beings spend all that energy, instead of feeding themselves, make artwork? So that's one of the markers of looking at paleoanthropology and how it then weaves into our story of what it means to believe in God in the context of a Christian uh, notion. Now we move further to the next step. The other area of science I'm working on in cognitive neuroscience. What, what am I interested in, right? I'm interested in damaged brains and 
what do we mean as a church when we ask or expect or require people to say, I can only be a Christian if I make a cognitive move and make a proclamation, I believe, you know, all the creeds, all this sort of stuff. About 2% of all human beings at the upper margin are born with some level of compromised brains. But these are detectable compromised brains. What about those that are not detectable? In 2012, I was at the Cambridge uh, uh, Autism Centre and uh, doing some studies and looking at what constitutes autism. And it's quite fascinating because the professor said to me, I've seen your background and you have a very strange background to study autism here because you are a theologian. Why in the world are you doing this? And I said, because I want to know what it means to be normal. What is a normal brain? What is autism? Now, the conclusion that he gave at the end of the week-long seminar was that, in fact, we are all autistic, except when your autism hits a certain threshold, then we say, oh, yeah, that's an autistic guy. But in fact, we are all autistic at some level because there's no perfect mind. So I began to think about, in an analogical way, what are we talking about in terms of the human mind and say, God's mind, if you must. And I'm using terms that maybe would be uh, too reductionist for the idea of God. But could it well be, from a theological point of view, all of us are spiritually autistic in the sense that we don't quite fully get it and we need help along the way to get to the next point. But when we think we don't, then we don't get the sort of help. The idea of a theological autism took root. And for some of you who are wondering, I'm, I'm very careful not to make sure that it's a public um, uh, lecture, so I don't want to go too much detail. But some of the resources I drew from, some of you know, come from the Middle Ages, the idea of William of Ockham and John Dunn Scotus, the idea of nolition, the idea of the opposite of making a will a nolition. So part of my work involves at what point does human brain, tempted as it is, can have a veto effect and stop itself from doing something it says it wants to do. And the long and short of it all is about 200 milliseconds where you can say, I want to do something, but before your body acts it out muscularly, your brain pulls it back and you can do. So it's called a window of opportunity uh, before you end up doing something. So one example I'm going to give is this. When we look at um, people who race in especially sprints, 100 meters, at what point, how fast before they hear a gun and the muscles move? The typical fast um, Olympic um, sprinter is 0 0.13 of a second. But if you do it too fast, then you're suspect. And the Olympic Committee argues that a human body cannot respond beyond a certain speed. And if you do it too quickly, it's called a false start, and you lose the race right there, right? Why do you call it a false start? Because they've measured how fast the brain signals go to the muscles, and there are two signaling, one is electrical and one is chemical. So they're asking these questions. If you do that, then you've got to be cheating because you are anticipating the gun and you go ahead before the gun goes off. Well, um, in all of this modeling that we're looking at in, in my own studies, we ask the question, at what point does a human brain make a decision outside of itself, and at what point does a consciousness kick in and say, I want to do this or I don't want to do this? Now, that led to other issues like multiple personalities. And as a former lawyer, this was one thing that was raised years ago. If someone has 10 personalities, and by the way, Sylvia in 1972 had 11 personalities. If you recall, it became a movie. Um, what if she had so many personalities and one personality killed, another didn't? Do you, put a, do you put a person in prison because of the body or because of the mind? You can see the complexities involved. Now you take that into a spiritual dimension. Can a person having multiple personalities be at once a Christian and not a Christian? Hmm. What does that mean in the context of being human? So that led further into the afterlife. When we say in the Christian context of missions, um, be a Christian so that you can have an afterlife, what does afterlife mean? To understand afterlife, we need to understand death. And of course, death happens at many different levels. At the organic level, the human person, it happens at a tissue level. Uh, organic level. So if your liver dies, did you die? But since we can replace the liver, we're still good to go, right? If your heart has a problem, you can have pig valves to fix it. Now you're part pig, by the way. But are you still you? If you wear contact lenses, are you fully you or are you a cyborg? You can see all the problems that comes with it. And, and finally, at a cellular level, 
What if 80% of your cells are dead, but you're not fully dead yet because 20% are still alive? So we begin to ask ourselves a lot of questions like, are we a singularity, a human person, or are we a colony that thinks it's a singularity? A hundred trillion cells. That's kind of scary stuff, by the way, right? But it's true. You take the human cells apart, you put in a petri dish, it exists on its own. With enough nutrients, it can live for a long time. Is it a living thing? And of course, some people joke about this too. Um, is the human female egg an independent living thing with the right constraints? But if you say that's cheating to be able to live, you shouldn't have all the chemical helps. But we have all kinds of chemical and mechanical helps. Every time you take a pill, it's a chemical help. Is that cheating in terms of life? So these were some of the questions that were uh, raised in the context of science and theology. And now, as we look at uh, we look at the Silk Road and why I was in the Silk Road to look at all these different religions and we look at the science part of it we now want to bring together the whole idea of how do we, let me just get this straight how do we understand the issue of missions when it went out you can't see it clearly here but this is a plaque I found outside a museum in Pakistan, in Taksila. And in one of the lines, it says, AD 40, the arrival of the Apostle Thomas. Oh, wrong slide. Oops, I must have touched something. There we go. Okay, in one of the slides, it's AD 40. I promise you it's there. When I saw that, I, I, was, I was delighted and shocked at the same time. I said, it's a Muslim country. Why is it celebrating the arrival of the Apostle Thomas, right? Well, I got a bigger shock. So here's a Muslim country with a plaque in a museum, the most prestigious museum talking about Apostle Thomas. But in fact, for a long time, they were Buddhists. How did you become Buddhist? And they said, we've all been Buddhist. And, and the guide said, don't you know, Pakistan was the seventh province of Tibet. Did you know that? Did you know that Pakistan was part of Tibet? Well, let me show you another map, yeah? Oh. Oh, this is the... Oh, this is not it. Sorry about this. I'm trying to get to... There we go. Look at Tibet here. Huge! All the way to Fergana. Fergana is Uzbekistan, in what was, which was once a part of the USSR. All the way down to China, down to Bangladesh, right into the heart of China itself. Chang'an is over there, Chengdu is over there, right? And all the way towards Mongolia. That was Tibet. And if you go to Mongolia today, you will see a lot of Tibetan influences. Um, so in Tibet, we looked at the mosque, and guess what? Uh, sorry, in uh, Pakistan. The mosques of northern Pakistan have um, Tibetan architecture into it. Now, what does that mean from a, from a point of view of religious uh, history? It means that all these religions began to interact a long time ago. And now, we look back in the 21st century and we think, well, there's always been Lutherans here and Presbyterians here and Methodists here, but at one time, it just wasn't the case. They connected, and we asked ourselves a lot of questions. Why did they change religion? Why did they change en masse, whole country? Well, part of it is easy, because if the king changes and you don't, you're dead, simple as that. <laughs> right? I hope there are not very many Anglicans here, but if they are, well, tough. Um, when you think about it, and you grew up in the 16th century in England, one moment, you're basically Catholic, and then Henry VIII wants a second wife, and all of a sudden, Church of England. And then Mary came to power, Catholic. Then Elizabeth came to power, and now it's not like the father. It's very close to modern Anglicanism, which means every day when you get up to survive, you've got to ask, which religion are we today? Because if you're the wrong one, it's over, right? So I tell my English friends, the fact that you're alive today is a remarkable decision based on every parent ever had in the past. Everyone made the right decision at the right time. You make one, one false move, it's over, and you won't exist. Think about how contingent it is. So we ask ourselves this question. Um, if I travel to these different countries and I see all this funky stuff that doesn't seem to connect to the modern idea of the separation, the clean separation of religions, what does it mean in the context of God? 
What would God actually do if God had a free hand in the way religion is practiced today, including Christianity? And something for you to think about, right? How far have we gone? In terms of missions, because this is a mission lecture, um, we're going to ask ourselves, what are we saying to the outside world when we say, welcome to the Christian community? What community are we talking about? We also know in the very history of Christianity itself, we change a great deal. At one time, slavery was okay. At one time, and to some, um, at some level, even today, sexism is still okay. And at some level, economic disparity is still okay. So we, we have to answer a lot of these questions to us. And I, I remember, in terms of religion, Christianity is not the only one that suffered. The um, Chinese Buddhism has a story, a legend of Kuan Yin, a female goddess of mercy, and she lives on the moon. You can imagine what happened in July 1969, yeah? Neil Armstrong went to the moon and there was no Kuan Yin around, right? <laughs> what was the apologetic of the Buddhism at the time? She was on the dark side. That's why you couldn't find her. Aha! Duh, we may smile at that. Now, they come back to me and said, look, at least we have no talking snakes, huh? We don't have donkeys that talk, and you're laughing at me. Now, what I began to think about this, because I came from such a, a, a disparate culture, grew up in the East and now in the West, you begin to realize that very often, um, the miracles of our enemies are in fact superstition, and our superstitions are miracles, because miracles are nicer than the word magic. So we have all these um, prejudices that's built into the way a vocabulary works. We ask these sort of questions because now we can check the facts. In the past, we just couldn't do it. We couldn't go to Taxila and find out what was Christianity like in the first century, the second century, the third century. One more example of encounters in Christian missions. In the seventh century, the Church of the East, based in, we think, is somewhere either in Baghdad or somewhere west uh, of Baghdad, sent missionaries to China in the seventh century, and the guy's name is Alopen. We don't know his real name. He was given a name by the Tang Dynasty, second emperor. And he brought in, well, today we call it Nestorian Christianity. And that Christianity has a lot of similarities with modern Christianity. It has Jesus, it has, it has Mary, it has Huin, it has the 24 holy books, which mean, refers to the Old Testament. Why did the early church, um, when they split up into three big categories of African church and the Asian church and the European church, did not consolidate the ideas and have a single story. Well, partly politics, partly economics. But by the time the Chinese had it, they had it for a long time. And then when the Tang Dynasty fell in the 10th century, it also fell into disuse. It was rediscovered in 1623 by Franciscans who were digging in Chang'an, modern Xi'an. And they saw that, in fact, Christianity was there a thousand years before them and they couldn't believe it. And of course, a big fight about, is it really Christianity if it's not one of us? That sort of thing, right? And you'll find Hudson Taylor in the 20th century, Robert Morrison in the 18th century, uh, 19th century. Most groups will go and believe that they are the first in China because it has some cachet on that. But even the seventh century, they were not the first. There were others who went before that. So the Silk Road was fascinating for me because I keep learning things about the history that's not written down. And one reason it wasn't written down was recognition. If it's not recognized as legitimate Christianity, it will not be written down as part of church history. So it's something to think about. Now, I remember here at Luther Seminary, you guys have had, you're, you're quite far ahead of the curve. You've had uh, people in world Christianity come to speak, and I remember that. Scott Sunquist is one of them, I still recall, who was here, and he'll give you a lot of stories about what happened. So I won't um, repeat it. But in all of these studies on world religions, on the movement of ideas, changes of religion coming in, what does that say? Well, I began to look at the doctrine of revelation in the Christian world. How do we know that all that we know today that is in our context revealed by God is the end result? There's nothing else beyond it, and we don't really know. But we do know as long as archaeology continues to exist, we will constantly have new ideas. Um, what about people who write commentaries on Old and New Testament, as well as the non-canonical books? What is it they rely on? And a lot of it is new investigations, not just of text, but also artifactual discoveries. 
of archaeologists everywhere in the world. And of course, archaeology itself is not a strict science. It's an interpretive science. You've got to interpret the data. You can have the data, and you can have different ways of conjuring what it really means. But, but what you want to say is, when we look at all these changes, uh, I just want to quickly show you, if I have it here, the Buddha heads. Okay, um, there we go. Okay, these are a sample of the Buddha heads that I got in Pakistan. This was among the first of the representations of the Buddha as a face, right? And of course, even though he was classically what we call today Nepali, from Nepal, or northern India, the early faces were not strictly Indian. They, they had part of the Greek influence and Gandharan to show that. When Buddhism uh, went there, it was the same time that Thomas would have been around. So, of course, my interest was piqued. Did the Apostle Thomas meet the Buddhists there? Same time, Kanishka, the first Buddhist council. They also have councils, by the way. For those of you who are in Christian history, we have four ecumenical councils. They also had four councils. After their four councils met 100 years apart. They met the 5th century, 4th century, 3rd century, 2nd century. And they were also trying to figure out what is it we believe in as part of Buddhism. Um, what are we, how are we doing for time? Okay, I want to close soon because I really want to take some questions if you have any. And in the context then of humans, uh, I'll talk about human evolution. We talked about the human brain's development. Part of the things that really bother me, and I hope one day we'll get some kind of solution to this is, as we use apologetics to fuel mission studies, what can we say to people with the anguish of asking questions like, I have loved ones whose brains are so damaged, they cannot receive Jesus. Are they welcome into the community? They can never do that. Do we need to rewrite our idea of what it means to be a Christian and what are the minimal constraints that allow us to say this is Christianity itself? Now, I have a partial answer. It's not fully satisfactory, but it's a work in progress. And part of what I'm thinking about is this. If we take cognition as something we can measure, and of course today our measurements are very crude using functional MRI, ProScan, CAT scan, we are basically measuring changes in sugar movements and energy. We're not really measuring thoughts. You can't measure a thought because a thought is a first-person experience. If I tell you I saw a blue car, you will never know what I actually mean because blue is simply an index number that we place on the potential of 10 million possible ideas of what is blue in our, in our eyes, but we can never, you can never share my idea of what a blue color is. So if that's the case, if I say in the cognition, how do I know whether a person is alive or thinking? It's all about instrumentation. As our instruments get better, we are better able to detect. I'm arguing we cannot detect, we can kind of detect whether we think the brain is functioning, we can't detect what the brain is thinking. We can't detect the unilateral movement of God to the human brain. We assume that becoming a Christian has to be from a human to a God context. We do not know the direction of thought, of cognition. We have no idea what that means. But we're slowly beginning to have instrumentation to get towards a better idea of what it means to measure a brain. If that's the case then, if we take as a starting point that the Creator God didn't have to, but did create. And the Creator God, if nothing um, encompasses the idea of love, then surely something as fragile and contingent as neuronal uh, collapse, the, the, the collapse of a human brain cells, will not stop God from connecting to the human brain itself. The problem isn't the person with autism or Alzheimer's or brain damage. The problem is those of us who think we are normal. That's our problem. We think that if we can't detect it, it's not there. But that's not the case. And I don't have the reference now, but some years ago, there was a case of a man who was in a vegetative state for 13 years. And he was kept alive. They did not pull the plug. And then one day, un no one knows why it happened, he awoke, right? And the first thing he said was, I'm so angry at all the nurses and my friends who came because they said bad things about me and they think I cannot hear. He heard everything for 13 years. He just couldn't move. 
He was stuck in the living tomb, so to speak. I can't even begin to imagine the tragedy of that, that living tomb situation, right? But there he was. Now, after that case came out, um, a lot of states in the US, as well as countries across the world, were very concerned about pulling the plug too early. Because today, we don't have a foolproof way to know when a person is actually dead. It sounds easy, isn't it? We don't. Sailors in the past didn't have either, and that's why if you died on a sailing ship, they will stitch your nose to the fabric covering your body because you may be drunk. They figured even a drunk person will feel the pain and wake up. And they figure that if they can do that, they will know that they're truly dead because they don't know whether you're really dead. And even today, we have that problem. Um, let me kind of put it all together this way. I came to tell you about my work um, as an apologist and eventually how it shaped the idea of missions. What are the challenges today? We mentioned world religions and science as a challenge. What are the challenges of world religions that they exist? So something is out there. And this lecture is not broad enough to look at all the ramifications, but it's enough for us to be aware. Um, how wide is God's love and how big is the umbrella? At what point do we have nuances that are geo-historically constrained rather than theologically constrained? Meaning, because they were born in a certain place in the world, their vocabularies are different. My argument is that the Christian world has seven vocabularies that we adopted, Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian, Greek, and Roman. These are the vocabularies that the Bible was written out of. So we have these categories. There are others with Sanskrit, perhaps, and Pali. So they have different ways to understand this. Um, can we learn from them? Do we understand the bigger picture of God? In terms of science, the two pressing things that I think uh, exist today is the idea of, do we still, is it how important it is for us to know our origins? from a purely paleoanthropological point of view uh, as humans. At what point did we become human? And secondly, how important is cognition for us? Um, in the context of God's love, in the context of Jesus, right? Are we measured based on our cognitive ability or are we measured based on the fact we exist and we are the objects of love? And to that extent, then we say, what was one of the greatest teachings that Jesus gave that we find so hard to follow? It's the love command, not just the love command, but for the weak among you, which is kind of hard. It's hard to love the unlovely. It really, really is, because we gravitate towards winners. I want to uh, be able to close here so that we can take maybe one or two questions if you have, and please, please, don't feel bad about asking awkward questions because I'm an apologist. You ca I can assure you, you cannot offend me with your questions. Okay. So, thank you very much. We can take a couple of questions. We have time for maybe one or two, depending on how long the first one is, questions before we go. Would anyone like to raise their hand and have me come to them? Oh, thank you. You kind of briefly mentioned something, and I wanted you to clarify, if I'm taking it correctly, about the direction of thought in regard to God. Ah, good. Um, we assume that in order to so-called be part of the Christian fabric and to attain salvation, we have to make that cognitive leap we say something to say, God, I want to follow you, right? We, don't, we cannot detect the response of God, so to speak. So we ask the question, is becoming a Christian, in quotation marks, an act of unilateral connection between the human and God, or is it also between God and us? And if we have no voice, can God be our voice? In the sense that, can God reach out to us in a way we cannot detect scientifically, but it exists? And if it does, as a church, how do we identify that? Have you noticed that um, we're all very selfish? When someone's loved one is dying and the person says, my grandfather died and I guess he didn't receive Christ. So yeah, I'm kind of sad, but you know. When our loved ones are dying, I can assure you, this is anecdotally true. You know, 
My father couldn't speak a word, but I, I can sense at the last minute he accepted Christ. Somehow, I can sense it because we want to. And I think part of the constraints we put on ourselves is that we put a constraint that if 2% of the human population cannot perform, then surely we have to rethink the idea of cognitive acceptance of Christ. That's basically it. Do you think syncretism is a natural um, kind of evolutionary progression for human thought towards right. God and sort of that idea of uh, things will move together, merge together as we are kind of one world? Oh, I see. Okay. Um, well, in the Christian faith, we move in the other direction. We started having a lot of denominations. Now there are 42,000 in the U.S. alone. So, so if you ask, uh, does syncretization works? Well, syncretization is a dirty word in many circles, right? It means you're not keeping to the truth. Well, I defy any historian of religion to tell me what is the original of any religion. We just don't have it. We don't have documentation. Um, we have traditions. But you see, every tradition was once a novelty. If a novelty lives long enough, it becomes a tradition. So that's... <laughs> Not good enough. So when someone says, we have always believed this. No, you haven't. <laughs> you think you do. No, you haven't. Why can I say that? Well, I'll tell you what. Because I do anthropology, um, paleoanthropology. I don't care how old the religion is. It's not older than 300,000 years. That's just a homogeneous. Those who came to my workshop, uh, one o'clock, you saw I put a chart up for the non-homo. So still hominids. 7 million years old in Chad, the country of Chad in um, Central Africa. So my point is that if I go further back in time, there's still humans, but there's no religion. There's still humans, but there's no uh, spirituality. There's still humans, but there's no art yet. And by the way, art is not the only one. The other thing people are exploring is dance, believe it or not. The human body's response to music is such that we t babies tend to dance very early on. They want to dance. And by the way, for those of you who are also interested in this, if you have babies at the age of two, look out for them because that's when they learn to lie. And lying is very important because if a baby can't lie, we're in trouble. Uh, social, <laughs> socially, socially, we want to tell all kinds of colored lies, but partly because lying is how we survive as a community. You know, someone says, how's my dress? Wonderful, honey. <laughs> Am I a bit heavy here? No, perfect. Um, my point about the nature of the human cognition is if you really want the truth, and as they say in the movies, you can't handle the truth, <laughs> can you? What we are handling is approximations to it. My personal thing is this. If you're trying to, like I once did as a young Christian, I want to know all the right things about God and be the perfect Christian, you're in a wrong game. Because God doesn't expect you to be perfect. God expects you to be loving. That's a lot harder than being perfect, I can assure you. <laughs>